We all share a passion for this critical infrastructure project, and having been on the front lines of this fight since I inherited these deteriorated, deteriorated bridges eight years ago, I understand their value and importance. Your city officials and CSX representatives have been making tremendous progress in the past few months since CSX had an accident that resulted in striking two bridges and rendering the only bridge open at the time impassable. Until that time, a hardline approach by the city, understanding and enforcing that the bridges are owned by CSX, resulted in a little negotiation. Public calls changed from hold CSX accountable to get the deal done, resulting in opportunities for the city to negotiate in good faith on behalf of citizens. The art of negotiating means that both parties arrive at the table with intended goals, and that both parties must expect to give up something to obtain those goals as many as possible. I'm pleased that CSX has been very cooperative in this process and has shared in the city's goal of expediency, knowing the urgency of the matter. But we must all understand that negotiating means we will not get everything that we as citizens want and some of the desires we may want come at great cost. With that, we'll proceed to an explanation of the purpose of a global agreement and how the Washington Street Bridge reconstruction or removal fits into that global agreement. For that explanation, I turn things over to Mr. Cohen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, please bear with me. I'm, I don't like the microphone. Uh, it just kind of messes with my voice, and so I'll hopefully warm up to it uh, after a couple minutes. As you all know, there is no written agreement regarding the repair, replacement, or inspection of the bridges. Um, if there was, we wouldn't be here now uh, doing what we're doing and arguing or trying to negotiate a solution with, with CSX. Um, that said, uh, those, uh, the time when such an agreement would have been made would have been probably in the 1850s. And that's, that's a long time ago. Um, so what we're going to do uh, with this agreement is we're going to try to address, we're going to address those issues so that we can work out a solution for the present time and also for the, the future, because future generations will also have a need to address issues pertaining to these bridges, and um, this will hopefully serve as the answer place for them uh, so that they don't have to go through this process that we're going through now. So, with that said, I'm going to address bridge by bridge uh, what, um, where we're heading with CSX, uh, some of the open issues that are involved, and some of the, the general considerations that are involved. So, starting with that, we'll, we'll first talk about the Cumberland Street Bridge. Uh, in that regard, uh, the last time that we were all together, uh, actually, the second to last time, uh, we had talked about, um, we talked about this process. Um, and we had noted that there was an interim agreement where we got the ball rolling. And I think it was at that meeting that we introduced the interim agreement and the mayor and city council um, approved it. And that enabled us to get that ball rolling. Um, as far as Cumberland Street goes, the design and construction is expected to be a, a two to three year process. CSX will be preparing a construction agreement to address issues from design to construction. When I say they'll be preparing it, uh, they're going to be preparing a first draft uh, with all of the agreements that are going to be executed in connection with this whole process. Um, someone has to draft it first, but rest assured, uh, just because there's a first draft of the document doesn't mean that that is the final draft. Uh, I think that in uh, most of the instances, if not all of them, there will be multiple drafts that will be passed back and forth between the parties so that we can reach solutions that um, serve everyone's best interests. Um, so we'll be looking for that hopefully within the next several weeks. Uh, at, at Cumberland Street, there are no clearance issues, no slope or, slope or site distance issues, uh, and being that there's no slope or site distance issues, we don't need to go to the state or federal government and request waivers and that's not the case with the Washington Street Bridge. Washington Street Bridge will involve requests for waivers. So in all respects, Cumberland Street Bridge is the easiest bridge to address. Now, as far as the funding for this bridge, uh, the mayor's, as far as the funding for this bridge goes, we are going to uh, seek federal funds. Uh, and under the federal funding regime, they can they will fund up to 80% of the bridge work, and that goes from design to construction. Uh, but that leaves the remaining 20%. Uh, so who's going to pay that 20%? Well, 
CSX has indicated that it would be willing to pay that 20% match. So although they have a budget in mind for the work, uh, the idea here is that this bridge will involve no cost of any kind to the city. Um, however, with the federal funding being used for, Seattle, or for Cumberland Street and for Baltimore Street, which is not something we're going to be talking about here today, uh, the vast majority of the available federal, federal funding will be used up. Uh, and we'll get to how that has impact when we discuss these other bridges. Uh, and that brings us then to Fayette Street. Uh, the Fayette Street Bridge, we're planning on, if all goes according to plan, we'd be using a, a modular bridge design. So what that, would, what that means is that the bridge parts will be constructed off-site, they'll be delivered to the site, and then uh, laid in place uh, with supp supplemental construction being done. The benefit to that is that the construction time is cut by two, uh, one half by, to two-thirds. Uh, so, realistically speaking, it's a four to six month build period, uh, and that is pretty fast. Um, but in addition to that, there's also a design period, and also the design for a modular bridge it takes less time as well, and that's expected to be an additional four to six months. Uh, the current clearance at Bayette Street is 18 feet six inches. Uh, that clearance is going to be need to be increased to a minimum of 21 feet 9 inches. CSX has already agreed to waive the federal standard um, height or clearance of 23 feet. Uh, we've spoken with them and have uh, urged them and tried to get them to agree to a lower height, uh, but they uh, as yet won't budge. Uh, and I don't think that they're going to be willing to voluntarily go below 21.9. Uh, at least that's my, my humble opinion. I think that um, the others in the negotiating team uh, share that impression. Um, with Fayette Street, there's the potential, if we were getting federal funds on this bridge, we'd need to get waivers as to the, the site distance and grade of the, the roadway. Um, however, uh, in this instance, we are not seeking federal funds. Uh, and as far as waivers go, it's not just, I'm sorry, it's not just site distance and, and grade, but also the, the clearance requirement, because the 23 foot clearance requirement is in fact a federal requirement. Good evening, good morning, thank Excuse please, me. Your telephone is sorry about that, folks. I was in court. I think Judge Fine would yell at me. Okay. Um, even though we don't need to have waivers, well, actually, let me, let me get back to where I was before my phone went off. Um, the, uh, the height requirement or the clearance requirement, uh, in order to get a federal waiver, CSX has to agree. In the absence of CSX's agreement, you don't get a waiver of the federal requirements. So um, that makes it all the more important to have CSX uh, in line with us in terms of uh, moving around or working around the federal requirements. Um, since federal funds, although federal funds won't be used for this bridge, uh, we need to be mindful of the fact that at some point in time in the future, this bridge is going to need to be rebuilt, hopefully more than 50 years from now. Um, it'll need to be repaired as well. And uh, in the event that repairs or reconstruction is necessary, uh, in order to access federal funds at that point in the future, we're going to need to make sure that this bridge is in fact constructed in accordance with the federal standards such that uh, at the time waivers would be required, we'd be able to get them to a reasonable degree of likelihood. So in the process of constructing this bridge, um, we are going to be very mindful of that and we're going to try to, to reach out to the federal and state governments to make inquiry as to whether or not under the current standards um, we would in fact be able to get a waiver if we sought it. Um, so uh, we're mindful of that fact. Um, with the increased height at Fayette Street or the increased clearance at Fayette Street, that's going to be three feet 
three inches more clearance than presently exists. And as a result of that, um, there's going to be some need to be some tapering of the road surface. So when you increase, so you've got your bridge, okay, and when you increase the height or the, the clearance, you would expect that the bridge height will also be increased. So you don't want to, it's the, it's the camel's hump effect. Now if you have a real steep camel's hump, it makes it harder for vehicles to travel over it. So the idea is you want to have a gradual slope from the crest of the bridge so that um, you have less issues with respect to uh, street grade, sight distance, and also travelability. Um, we believe at this point in time that there's one property that is going to need to be acquired in, in order to construct the bridge. Uh, and, and we're looking at that as uh, an acquisition that is actually going to be necessitated by the construction. We don't think that we'd be able to do the construction but for the acquisition of that property. Um, so I think that there have been some, maybe some uh, my, it, not terribly significant uh, conversations between certain officials and the property owner, and we expect that if and when that time comes that we, you know, our suspicions uh, come to reality, that we're gonna be able to, to do that without um, too much ado. Uh, but the idea here is that uh, with any acquisitions, we're going to uh, work with the property owners so that uh, the process will be as, as will involve as little pain as possible, and we, the, the goal will be to make the property owners uh, as happy as possible with the end result. Um, with the bridge surface and road surface being raised, uh, we expect that there'll be a need for some support structures on the sides that may involve some retaining walls, and to the extent that the road surface is higher than sidewalks, it may be necessary to put some steps in so that people um, moving up or walking up to the roadway uh, can get there uh, rather by so steps rather than having to walk up a hill. Uh, but we don't expect that at this location there be a need for uh, any sort of significant um, uh, retaining walls. And of course the steps, the installation of steps would be part of the construction process. Uh, now we get to the funding. As I alluded to, no federal funds will be involved um, and that's significant because, as I stated earlier, most of the federal funds are going to be exhausted through the replacement of the Fayette Street and Baltimore Street bridges. Cumberland. I'm sorry, yes, Cumberland and, and uh, Baltimore Street bridges. Thank you. Um, so what CSX is willing to do is they've indicated, subject to their budget, whatever that may be, that they would pay for uh, the uh, replacement of the, the Fayette Street Bridge. So what that enables us to do is somewhat contemporaneously with the work that's being done on Cumberland Street to also do the work on Fayette Street. And in fact, it may be the case, and we expect that it will be the case, that the Fayette Street Bridge replacement will be completed before Cumberland Street Bridge replacement is completed. What this enables us to do with this sort of a bridge design, a modular design rather than uh, a structure which is constructed on site, uh, we get an east-west corridor reestablished on a much more expedited basis. Uh, at least that's the plan. So um, that's Fayette Street. Uh, next we move to, to Green Street, which is sort of the wild card in the process. Uh, and I'll be explaining why that is, because it's sort of, a, it, it, it has, what happens at Green Street has an impact on what will happen at Washington Street. The underpass at Green Street, uh, trucks, for whatever reason, don't pay much attention to the signage that we have in place. And as a result, they hit that bridge about two to three times a year. Uh, that can cause damage to the bridge. And it certainly, as anyone knows who's been trying to get underneath that underpass, uh, when a, a tractor trailer has gotten jammed in underneath it, well, it creates a traffic snag. Um, so. What CSX would like to do is they would like to essentially increase the clearance there. Right now, the clearance is 13 feet, 6 inches. And what they would like to do is increase it to 14 feet, 4 inches. Um, I know that the sign there says the clearance is 12 feet, 10 inches. 
Um, but the actual, that's, that's what we're encouraging trucks you know, to, to pass underneath, not to be any higher than that. We've, so that they, so we expect, and it is borne out, that they really don't pay much attention or as much attention to that sign as they should, um, and maybe figure that if they're a little bit higher than 1210, that they can still get underneath it. So we, we build in a little bit, I suppose there's a little bit of a fudge factor built in, um, but nevertheless, uh, the actual clearance that's at that location is 13 feet, six inches. Now, city officials who attended the West Side uh, study traffic planning, the West Side traffic planning study, which was a study that CSX um, paid for uh, to address possibilities or possible answers to the, the West Side bridge problems. Um, the city officials that attended those meetings about three years ago left with the impression that in order to, or for CSX to get the increased clearance at Green Street, that they would not have to change the actual structure of the bridge. So rather, um, I'm sorry, not change the actual um, deck of the bridge. The deck of the bridge is where the, the train travels over. So rather than changing the height of the deck, um, what we thought, or the the, the city officials who attended that meeting, I did, I did not attend, but what the officials who attended that meeting thought was that they keep the deck at the same height, but the steel superstructure would be raised up uh, so that you'd have a greater clearance. So train would stay at the same height, the tracks would stay at the same height, but the steel superstructure would be raised. Uh, when we met with CSX the last time, CSX uh, made it clear that the city's impression was mistaken. Uh, so they told us that they thought that, uh, well, the current design or their current plans were to increase the height of the decking um, by 10 inches or so, uh, which is the actual increase in the clearance. Uh, now, the significance of that in terms of Washington Street is that when you increase the clearance and you increase the height of the decking, you're also increase, increasing the height of the track. And because you're increasing the height of the track, as you go off that bridge, you can't just make a steep drop down and then proceed at the height where the track lays on the ground uh, in the area of the cut. Rather, there are some construction, or I'm sorry, engineering design issues that are involved. Uh, I won't bore you with the terminology, but the end result is that at Washington Street, um, the tracks would be raised two feet above where they are currently. Um, two feet, yes. Uh, and you know, obviously that's rather significant because if you have 18 feet, one inches of clearance right now at that location and you do the Green Street repairs or, or that are uh, remodeling that they're suggesting, then your 18 feet, one inches of clearance turns into 16 feet, one inches of clearance. And then if you increase that clearance there from 16 one to 21 feet, nine inches, well, the math is five feet, eight inch of clearance that needs to be recaptured, which is not a good thing. Um, so that presents additional challenges at that location. Um, we have some uh, ideas as to how to address that. Um, we asked them to, CSX that is, to consider other possibilities. Uh, one of which would be, leave Green Street alone. Just don't do it. You know, we can address, you know, if you're concerned about that bridge being struck, well, we can do a couple things. Uh, one, we can improve our signage. The other thing that we could do, and this was actually brought up um, by a CSX official, is to install what he called, a, I guess, a sacrifice barrier. Um, but what we did is we, our city engineer has done some looking into to that, and, and uh, what he found was several options to alert truck drivers that there are clearance issues up ahead, um, devices that we currently don't have in place. Anyone that's entered into a parking garage would note that when you go in, in most of these garages at least, there's a yellow bar. And the yellow bar says clearance of X number of feet. 
So if you're going in and your SUV or truck hits that bar, there's a good indication to you that at some point in that garage, you're going to get wedged in and stuck. So the idea of a sacrifice beam or bar or barrier, or whatever the term was, is pretty similar. Um, but rather than having uh, a device like that, I think what we'd probably be looking at is uh, a steel structure uh, that would uh, be on the side of the road. It'd be a post that goes up in the air, and then perpendicularly, perpendicularly there'd be another post. And there'd be signage on that post which says, if you hit this, you will hit the bridge. And I think that if a truck driver hits that, they should maybe know to stop. Um, the exact wording of that kind of a barrier and the signage there, um, we're just coming up with it's just a hypothetical possible resolution. Uh, but it's one that, that I think reasonable people would agree that would serve to minimize and hopefully eliminate the possibility of that bridge being struck by truck traffic. There are other possibilities as well, but this is the one that involves the least cost to everyone. And it's the solution that poses the least bit of problems for Washington Street bridge replacement. So for that reason, it's the one that we like the most. Um, but we're initiating discussions with CSX on this particular issue. Um, it's, uh, we've been looking into this since the, the last meeting. And uh, just today, I contacted and reached out to CSX's attorney. I provided him with a picture of such a device and asked him, what do you think? And I'm hoping that we'll get a favorable response from him and from their engineering team. Uh, but it's just one solution. There are other possibilities and obviously we will keep you posted in that regard. Um, so that brings us to Washington Street, and um, I think that there was a fear that the city was only considering the removal of that bridge. As we stated before and state again, that's, that's not the case. Um, but there are two options for that bridge. One is replacement and the other is removal. Um, those are the two options. Uh, we're not aware of any third option, but if anyone has a third option, you know, we're open to it. But I think that those are really the two ones. Uh, as far as replacement goes, um, as I stated, we've got 18 feet, 1 inches of clearance right now, and that's going to have to be increased to 21 feet, 9 inches. Um, for that location, if we, in fact, get federal funds for that bridge, we're going to have to address the site distance issue, and we'd have to apply for a waiver. Uh, and that waiver is supplied by both the state government and the federal government. The city would hire an outside engineering firm, uh, and the firm would have to be approved by the state and federal government. Uh, you can't just get any engineer to go and um, present uh, an application for a waiver. Rather, they want to hear from someone that they know is qualified to express a valid professional opinion on the particular issue. Uh, so we would certainly be employing one of those firms. Uh, we've used Wilson T. Ballard in the past. Um, they're an excellent firm. We've grown to rely upon them. They're on the approved list. But obviously, in the process, we need to ask the federal and state government what's Who's acceptable to you? Um, do you mind if we use Wilson T. Ballard? And we'd expect that they would say that they don't mind, but one thing I've learned is you can't predict what the future will hold, including what government will do or what it won't do. Um, hypothetically speaking, well, first off, this in this the waiver process involves two things. I guess one, the, one is that we need to show that we are not able to comply with existing regulations and standards as they apply to site distance. That this particular site presents design challenges that we simply cannot meet in order, and, and while at the same time meeting the site distance standards. The other part of it is that there is a number of criteria 
that the government will consider in passing on a request for a waiver. I think two meetings ago we addressed some of those issues, uh, some of those criteria, um, and if and when the time comes, well, when the time comes to request such a waiver, uh, it may be the case that the, the engineering firm will be asking us to, well, they, we will be working hand in hand with them, but to the extent that uh, we think that um, the public, uh, particularly Washington Street Association, may have some drawings or information that may be helpful, um, some pictures to show the historic significance of the, the neighborhood, we'll reach out to you uh, and, and ask for that assistance. Uh, I know that uh, two meetings ago, there was that picture that was um, showed the, uh, the lobster claw of the Arts and Entertainment District, I think it was, um, or that maybe it was the historic, uh, historic district. Um, that would be a good picture to utilize in a waiver request. So certainly, um, we're going to pass that picture on to the engineering firm that, that uh, assists the city in, in obtaining the, the waiver. Um, the granting or the denial of the waiver, the city doesn't get to make that decision. It's made by a third party. So if the waiver is denied, then uh, it, it's not the city's choice to have it denied. It would be the city's choice to have it granted. But the denial is outside of, or the, the decision on the waiver is outside of the city's hands. The only thing we can do is put our best foot forward. And that's why we would be doing that through uh, an engineering firm that we've grown to respect and rely upon. Um, but in the event that that waiver is denied, okay, that means that federal funds would not be available to us for the reconstruction of that bridge. So where that leaves us is there would be a, a funding gap. There'd be a gap between the amount that CSX might be willing to uh, donate for that project and the amount that would be needed to complete it. I know that uh, there have been some statements to the effect that uh, the state government has some funding source that might be available uh, to assist us in the event something like that would happen. Um, but you know, if, that, if that's the case, great. But when we met with the federal and state local elected officials and some of the people who were involved in uh, the funding process, some of the agencies that are involved in the funding process, they indicated that the federal funds were the only pot to draw from. So the indication that we had from the officials that are in charge of the process is that's where the funds are. There are no other funds available. So. If, we don't, if we're not able to meet the federal standards, we don't get the waiver, then we have to come up with money. That can be you know, possibly with the city raising funds through, through tax monies, uh, through bonds. There's other, other ways to do that, but you know, that's where we would be with respect to the funding issue and the unfortunate, and the unfortunate event that the waiver is not granted. So that's one waiver that's required. Another waiver is for the, the road grade standards. Um, the exact same process applies, the same issues are involved. Uh, so at the end of the day, if this waiver isn't granted, then the consequences relative to funding are the same. We've already addressed the issue of the site waiver, or it's not the site, the, the clearance waiver, um, but so long as CSX is amenable to the height that we, or the clearance that we um, decide upon in replacing that bridge, then we're good to go, and we don't need to worry about that waiver. It's pretty much respect is automatic, and that's what we've been led to believe. Now, when you increase the height of a bridge that's situated like Washington Street is, um, with site distance and grade issues already present, uh, we're expecting that there's going to be a need for retaining walls. The question is just how high will those retaining walls need to be? Uh, and that's the million dollar question. Um, certainly, if CSX is not willing to bend on Green Street and we have the matter of trying to gain an additional two feet of clearance due to the tracks being raised up by two feet, you can expect that the retaining walls at that location, at least closest to the bridge, will have to be two feet higher. Um, so at the end of the day, 
wherever we are when the time comes uh, to make the decision as to whether or not to replace Washington Street Bridge, the residents are going to have to decide how high is too high for the retaining walls. What is it that you can live with? So that brings us to the other option for Washington Street, the Washington Street Bridge, which is the removal of the bridge. Um, this is the option that applies if replacement is just not viable or what the, the residents decide that they just don't want to live with retaining walls. Uh, 